Good afternoon. I'm glad to see all of you here. Our topic today is unraveling the abstract, so I figured to get us started, I'll bring something which is anything but abstract. As you can see, this is a mini shovel, not the real thing, but a very close thing to the real thing. And I do some gardening in my spare time. I'm obsessed with shovels. I love them. They're very humble instruments, but they're amazingly versatile and durable. A shovel you can use to till up land if you're sowing. You can dig a hole and plant a tree. If you have any sort of manure, debris, mess outside that you want to clean, a shovel is again your best bet. Firefighters, by the way, use shovels to limit the spread of forest fires. And frequently, this is the only tool they can bring if there is a high altitude incident happening. Here, well, maybe later, <laughs> you can see them being used cleaning up the devastating consequences of the floods in Karlovo in the fall of last year. Shovels again. They were among the things that we collected and donated to Ukraine as part of a campaign and a few campaigns here and abroad to support the efforts there. And I'm sure that they were very well used by the volunteers as they were clearing the devastating consequences of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria earlier this year. So I think it's safe to say that any aspect of our lives as humans which requires hope clearing, laying foundations, beautification, genesis, sooner or later, has recourse at something like that. I'll leave it aside. I'm not a professional user. I'm not a firefighter, <laughs> I'm not a gardener, I'm not a builder. I shouldn't be considered an expert in using it. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Teach for Bulgaria. Uh, which is a non-for-profit working in education. I work for an NGO, which is somewhat of an abstract, nebulous, murky notion of an organization these days in Bulgaria. If you're not sure what an NGO does, you're not alone. According to a study commissioned by the Bulgarian Center for Nonprofit Law, only 16% of Bulgarians know what an NGO is and trust it. 48%, let's see if they add up, 46%, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> think they know what it is and don't trust it. And 38% have no idea what the term means. For those 38, and I'd like to argue a large portion of the 46, we need to unravel the abstract stat. What is and who is the non-government sector? Well, I'd like to suggest that that's all of you here, everyone out on the streets of Blagojevgrad, and pretty much everyone in this country. Now, of course, I'm the living proof that you can be a successful, gainfully employed, educated person and have no idea what an NGO is, which was my situation 12 years ago. In 2011, I was teaching literature, American literature and English at a public university in France, in the West, in Brittany, in the town of Rennes. And I was on the verge of achieving a lifelong dream. I had worked for 13 years between the US and France, studying, working, and I had a stab, a real shot, for the first time at a stable academic career. For this, I take no credit. Credit goes to my high school teachers at the American College of Sofia, where I was a student back in the day. My parents, I'm, I'm from Plovdiv, uh, they're a high school teacher and a railroad dispatcher. They couldn't afford to send me there, but I got a scholarship, many of us did, in the early 90s. And the fact that I got admitted and received what at the time 
was the best high school education in the country. Completely transformed my life trajectory. Subsequently, things looked much easier. I got scholarships, I got a BA, I got an MA, I got a PhD, learned French, moved to Paris, lived in Paris, studied there, etc., etc., etc. Then in 2011, I learned that a few fellow alumni from ACS were starting an initiative to improve Bulgarian education. The idea was that they would seek out, recruit, train and support the most talented people and send them, support them to work in the most underprivileged schools. Now, I never forgot what had happened to me because of the education that I was very lucky to have received. And of course, something in this mission struck a chord with me. I got in touch, long story short, took a leave of absence, came back to Bulgaria, and decided that for two years, I will support the first cohort of these newly found teachers. And then in two years' time, you know, dues paid or partially paid, I'd go back to my life and research in France. And so in 2011, I started working for an NGO, which is an organization I had never encountered before. You'd be happy to know I did not support teachers using my shovel. Because when you're supporting teachers, other things matter. Empathy matters. Perspective matters. Great conversations, suggestions, understanding, all of these things matter. And so for the first two years, I stood in the back of countless classrooms, observing lessons, taking notes, and suggesting interventions. I wanted to show you a picture of that time. <laughs> I didn't want it to be from a classroom, but we're moving classrooms, so I, we took this one. I sat in the back of these classrooms, and the whole time, I thought about how lucky I had been. Because in Bulgaria, the kind of family you were born into fully determines the kind of education you will receive. Moreover, it charts the rest of your life trajectory for you. My teachers had managed to change it for me. And I know you will find this, I hope you find this, as melodramatic as I feel when I'm saying it. But I wanted to do that too. I wanted to do the same. And of course, two years is a naively short time to accomplish something like that. So when they were up, and my leave of absence was up, I stayed. And so, of course, the question I received subsequently, many years later, I still receive is, why stay? Why not leave? I mean, surely there are so many other opportunities to be successful and do other things. Maybe that's true. In recent years, working for an NGO in Bulgaria, I tell you, has been no picnic. The sector has come under some serious attack and, you know, in some circles is perceived as a very dubious presence. Last year in October, we even had a bill, um, attempted, attempted bill, to designate everybody working for an organization receiving foreign international donations, a foreign agent, a foreign agent, a person of dubious affiliations and affiliations. So why stay? Well, I stay because I enjoy being surrounded by people who are shoveling. And these people are using their designated instruments to work on improving the world in which we live. And I'm here today to tell you that all of us belong there because the notion of the non-government and civic sector is directly related to the notion of citizenship and belonging. As citizens, we have rights. We also have the responsibility to protect equity, equality, and access for everyone. How we treat the vulnerable and the forgotten is a testament to the degree to which we're human and we're civilized. 
the extent to which we hold public officials responsible for the spending of public funding directly corresponds to the quality of life we all have. Whether we do this through an NGO or as private citizens doesn't matter. What matters is that all of us participate. And so I stay because my life is full of people who donate, engage, help out, become active. And these people are not an abstract. They are the life and blood of what we call the non-government sector. And once again, I believe every one of us belongs there. And so today, I'd like to bring your attention to three things all of us can do in order to claim our rightful space and place as part of the non-government, not-for-profit civic center. And I know that a lot of you do that already. Number one, understand the stakes of participation and non-participation. When we show up for the causes in which we believe and we bring the tools with which we can influence change, we directly help strengthen the public sector. NGOs are one option. They possess the know-how, the agility, the expertise, and the gut to re respond in a very agile and quick manner when a crisis strikes. We saw this, unfortunately, we had many opportunities to see this in the past few years. The COVID-19 crisis, the war in the Ukraine, the earthquakes in Syria and Turkey. Within hours of each emergency, it was the civic sector that was gathering resources, dispatching volunteers, building shelters, and sharing information and ideas with people experiencing genuine crisis. And this in Bulgaria was an amazing, massive effort. Even though, according to Alpha Research, one of our agencies uh, doing sociological research, only 14% of Bulgarians volunteer. We need to increase this number. Every percentage point up is an investment in the shared dignity of all of us. Number two, demand change. And I know this is hard because nobody likes, truly likes to change. Stand up for what we believe in if it serves the public good. Engage with politicians and local representatives, members of parliament, before they get there, but especially after they do. Hold them accountable for what happens to their pre-election promises and attend parliamentary sessions, municipal hearings, different commissions, when issues that are of concern to all of us as citizens concerning the dignity, equity, and access of all of us are at stake. In Bulgaria, these are public. Everyone can go, attend, and voice an opinion. In Parliament, all you have to do is call in advance and leave your name. Politicians tend to prioritize those issues in which the public seems to be most interested. Make them see and care. Number three, support the NGO sector. Help it overcome a position of obscurity and hostility it finds itself in, in certain contexts and situations. Research those organizations that stand up for the things in which you believe. Make sure they are responsible with resources and make sure they do meaningful work. Of course, as everywhere, some of them won't. Lean into their expertise and give them the visibility and the attention that they deserve. They've proven time and again that they are actually truly helpful. I started with some really disturbing statistics about the 16%, but the same survey, the one that the Center for Nonprofit Law uh, conducts, says that 60% of people who have ever encountered an NGO report extremely high levels of trust afterwards. And then, you know, trickles down to high levels of trust, etc. So this is something you might actually like. 
You know, the hardest thing about finishing a TED talk is the conclusion, right? So it took me a while. And so I figured that one thing I'd like to bring to your attention is maybe talk about two people who embody the power and the potential of the civic sector. And soon there'll be fellow alumni for you. It's especially relevant on this stage because they're AOBG alumni. Of course, we've all heard about our amazing director, who's Christo Grozev, whose journalistic integrity and commitment to the truth are worth at least an Academy Award. You also know about Manol Pekov, whose campaigns have brought hope to millions of people. Uh, he's raised millions of leva and, and hope, helped thousands of people in the recent crisis. I know these are people who inspire you and they inspire me. But at the end of the day, it seems to me that they're just two people who saw that some shoveling has to be done and just did it. Your causes will be different from theirs. Your tools will be different from theirs and from mine. It seems to me that the only thing that matters is picking an instrument and putting it to good use. And with this, I'd like to wish you happy shoveling. Thank you.